I will wake up at 4 a.m. and not stop until 5 p.m. And then when I stop, I now, okay, I'm going to spend time with my children and my wife. Believe it or not, like I can bite one of their heads off and not even realize it. And it's just because I just gave my best for 13 hours to everyone else besides who means the most to me. So I'm realigning, rebalancing God, then family, then business. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the High Voltage Business Builders. If you haven't liked, subscribed, or commented on any of these videos, get off my platform right now. No, I'm just kidding. Help me beat big tech by sharing, liking these podcasts and welcoming a guest today. We're going to be talking with someone who we had a very first fun conversation. I enjoyed it personally and getting to know him, and I'm excited to have him on here today to talk about additional ways to make income. That's one of the things we do talk about here. Of course, we focus on things of e-commerce and business and mindset and all the things that wrap up around that. But we also talk about alternatives to wealth without Wall Street and building income and other ways that you could potentially take Airbnb, vacation rentals, business of of different natures. We've talked about a lot of that on here and creating opportunities with people who I consider to be high voltage business builders. So I'm honored to welcome Brent Bowers to the call uh, today and the show to talk a little bit about the land sharks. I am fired up. I feel like I've gotten additional voltage just being on here. So name is everything. (laughs) Yeah, dude. High voltage, right? So that's why we do 25 minutes of chatting and just kind of having a conversation. It's unscripted. I know a lot of people, and and I saw this the other day, want to do like the 15 point or 59 bullet point interview sheet before the call. And I will usually just be like, yeah. And for that reason, I'm out. Yeah. So we usually just like to get on here and have a convo. So let's just start talking. Tell us how you got involved in real estate, something of of interest to you or something you fell into. Like, how did this whole thing evolve? I ultimately fell into it. You know, I I fell into it. I wanted I always had this calling to it. I I dabbled in it in 2007 and then I quit because it got too hard in 2008, 2009, ended up moving in with my in-laws because I couldn't afford to pay my bills and join the military. Yeah, it was pretty tough times. And I was pretty humbled because I went from owning a business. I had gotten that real estate license, bought that first rental property. But 2008 and nine just happened for me. I'll tell you what, it just definitely made me a stronger, better, grittier person. Then I was like, I'm going to go back to school. I couldn't afford to go back to school. So I went to the military and kind of just worked through the military and went up in ranks. And then life was happening so fast and multiple combat deployments, failed marriage. And it's just kind of was like when I was finally starting to build up again, it's like my world got rocked again. So yeah. 2013, the army pulls me out of Afghanistan to send me to college. Finally, only took several years from 2009 to 2013 to finally make it happen and ended up Getting back into real estate, started house hacking. Basically, I bought a house with the VA loan next to the college and rented out all the rooms. And I was getting paid to live there. Met the woman of my dreams. We got married. Army then moves me to Colorado. And guess what? History was repeating itself. I'm preparing for third combat deployment number three. And what we, Thanks. what no one ever talks about is you're away from home for about a year prior before you leave for home to a combat zone for a year, roughly. So military is like hardly ever at home. So I was scared to death. I was like, oh man, I'm going to lose another marriage. So I started searching for answers, listening to things like the high voltage podcast, building businesses and just searching for answers. And I heard a guy talking about land flipping and I took massive, violent, imperfect action that day. (laughs) That's exactly what I talk about. And perfect action, right? Started happening. Yeah, dude, that's quite a story, man. There's a lot to unpack there. I'm not sure what sides of that rabbit hole you want to go down today. Hey, it's whatever but, provides value for your audience. That's all that matters. Well, first up, thank you for your service. I appreciate that. And it, it's very appreciative of all the uh, women and men in, in combat or non-situations that protect us and give us the freedoms and ability to go out today and have these kind of conversations with people. I'm very honored that you did that for us. And I don't take it lightly. My dad was a two tour Vietnam combat uh, veteran. And so I was not, my goal was to go be in the Air Force, but I got rejected by the fighter school. Because I was too big hey. to on text. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> the, the Air Force wouldn't take me either. They told me to they go next to you the Army. Seriously, 100% could not get in the Air Force to save my oh, life. No. Well, there's not a- and I wasn't even trying to be anything cool. I just wanted to go in the Air Force. <laughs> well, what did you want to do in the Air Force? Whatever they told me, that I would have scrubbed toilets, honestly, because that's right. how bad, rough my life was in 2009. Oh, yeah. I couldn't even, like, I wonder why I was broke. I couldn't get out of the bed till 11 a.m. in the morning because I was depressed because I lived with my in-laws. 
and yeah. couldn't afford my, to pay my payments. Yeah, I would have scrubbed toilets for the Air Force, but they wouldn't let me in. So I ended up joining the military or the Army. <laughs> See, I was not, no, maybe scrubbing mm-hmm. toilets wasn't on my agenda. I had just dreamed, like all children to some degree, we dream these dreams. We have these backyard adventures. And then life and reality gets in the way of that. And we compromise our realities for our dreams. And then we struggle to get through the reality to get back to our dreams. It seems like a never ending theme, right? How did you break out of that? How did you break out of that risk? What got you past the, the moments of depression on your in-laws couch? If someone's listening to this, they going, well, that sounds really overwhelming. And I feel that what really changed, where was that pivotal moment where you decided to get off the couch and get moving? Yeah, well, I had a a date to go to basic training and that was like the, it's almost like I went to college in Melbourne, Florida. We were in the race for space. I went to Florida Tech. Three, two, one, lift off. Just, hey, eventually the clock runs out and you got to get your butt up off the couch and and start moving. Sometimes we just need that jolt. But I'll tell you my, the reason how I was able to build this land investing business that gives me financial freedom and time freedom and ultimately made me a multimillionaire in real estate very quickly was because I had a huge why. And that why was fear Mm. of another divorce. Now I have a child involved and I just did not want to go through that again. So I started building a business around me and my family that nothing will ever get through financially and was able to build that passive income and land within about nine months that replaced my expenses. My expenses were only $4,500 a month back in 2016. And I was able to bring that in with land payments, people that I was seller financing land to. And that just kind of gave me a mindset shift like, okay, bills are covered. Now we can take risk. Fear, such a powerful motivator, right? It really, you're the embodiment of that phrase, feel the fear and do it anyways. But it's still some folks that fear is crippling. I fear is, it's like they're, they're on the train tracks of life and the train is coming and yet they're still so afraid they're just stuck there on the train track, watching it move and not taking any action to get themselves off of it. Did you have any friends or family that supported you in that? Did you have any, anyone else to encourage you in that process? My wife, she always just said, you know what? I trust you. I encourage it. And let me tell you, men listen to this. If you're not successful in what you're doing, it's probably because your wife is not backing you. And, And same thing with you ladies, like anybody listening to this, you have to have your spousal support. And it was just that knowing that she trusted me Boy, yeah. it gave me like a, a slingshot, like Shot a rubber adrenaline. band, adrenaline, yeah. voltage. No, and that's so powerful that you, yeah, dude, it's so powerful that you bring that up, right? It's, we don't always cover that kind of conversation at the relationship level because I do, I have experienced a burnout marriage before. And I will tell you that the, the person that I was involved with in, in, I were in competition to see who was the better person, the better builder, the better mm-hmm. everything. We weren't equally yoked. And that relationship drove me into depression and sadness. And now I'm in a relationship where my wife is now the same kind of person as you just described. Honey, I trust you. Go get it done. Do what you need to do it. I'm right here. I got everything covered at home. She's much more strong in her person and she's not competing for me. Power in the household structure. We've established our roles and we've established boundaries of of control in the home or or certain things. We do things, but without her, none of this is possible. That's so well put. I mean, I had a business coach and she was a female and she came through the Tony Robbins business mastery and business buildership. And one day I was like, man, I just wish my wife would understand, you know, what I'm doing, I'm building. I wish she would be like, want to go out and build things like this too. And she goes, are you serious? Do you really want to be married to yourself? And I was like, I was really like set back. And I was like, wait a minute. You're right. Mm, isn't that something? We, we took the disc assessment in our house the other day with all my children and my wife took it. And it's something that if you're not familiar with that, the DISC personality assessment for life business, it kind of conglomerates your person, position, thought processes, et cetera. And it was a revelation moment to just put into to words a little bit of something I already understood of our 18 years together. She is very much the SC. She's very much the stable, standard, conscientious person in our household. And I am definitely the dominant I influencer slash outward person. That's me. She prefers to not be outward. She likes to stay more home and do the things she needs to do and follows a structure and a path. That's why she has a BSN in nursing and she likes that practitioner path. She knows the path to take. Me, on the other hand, you put me on the path and I will find everything possible to break it. I will get off of it. I will jump off of it. I will take other people off the path of me. I will look as though I'm destroying everything. 
in the process of being a DI. And I've come to realize that the old saying opposites attract is really true. Yeah. And when I looked backwards at the original relationship, and maybe you can say this, the same similar thing to your relationship, we were too much alike. Yep. And therefore, we were constantly competing with each other. And for the men on this call and the men that I talk to or anybody who's listening to this who might be a man, the I was going to say something completely non inappropriate. In you just let that train brain wreck keep going. <laughs> that sure. No, pull back, pull back. Man up. I don't know how to say it any differently. Man up. It's not a domineering aspect of taking over your wife or her position or that situation and not like go home and start making demands. No, it's God, just you no. need to man up as a role model for your family and your position. And if you're wondering why you're struggling, why you hate your job, why you don't feel you're free in the things you're doing, it's usually because it's in your mind. And because that mind is now overtaking matter, you're pushing it out into your environment. You're doing it to the kids and the wife and you come home disgruntled and you need to shut that down. Like, yeah. How do you shut it down? Because I know we both face this. We you do, know right? what? We, sometimes we just beat ourselves up to death some days, right? Am I wrong? 100%. And as business owners, as entrepreneurs, we're always going to be out of balance and we're always going to be looking to find that balance again. Me and my wife literally just had this conversation a week and a half ago is I'm going to stop taxing myself so much during the day where as even though we built this business that can support us, we went on vacation almost all of March. And here's the thing though, we're builders, we're visionaries, we're high voltage business builders. And what we know is to build, 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 build. So we will run ourselves to death. Like I will wake up at 4 a.m. and not stop until 5 p.m. And then when I stop, I now, okay, I'm going to spend time with my children and my wife, Yeah, but I'm exhausted and I'll, I'm like, Believe it or not, like I can bite one of their heads off and not even realize it. And it's just because I just gave my best for 13 hours to everyone else besides who means the most to me. So I'm realigning, yep. rebalancing God, then family, then business. Yep. So it's such a powerful message, man. It really is. And it's good to hear someone else say that too. I don't always get to, to talk with people who understand it at the level that you do because we burn ourselves out. And one of the things I try to help people who ask me for help and, and, and want mentoring in this type of way, I'm like, look, if you're not a list maker, which a lot of entrepreneurial business owner minded guys like us are like, go, then you need to block time. If you can't make a list, block time. You got this thing called a calendar. You probably use and abuse it too much. During the day when you have energy, when you are awake, when you have moments, block an hour in for your family, just yeah. like you would block an hour in for another call. And when you do that, go sit with them, go be with them and check out for that moment. Go play yeah. a game with them. Do something in the no. energy hour that you have. No phone. Block that time out. Schedule it in. You will never regret it, right? You'll never regret blocking that time out because, oh, well, someone else might have wanted me in that minute for a meeting or a business thing, or I might lose a deal or an opportunity in that one hour. If that's the case, it probably was never yours to begin with. Well, you're right. And I've always had, and then by the way, no phone during that time. And that whole block is powerful. Like Locking tomorrow, it. I'm going to my son's school. I'm going to bring him lunch. He asked for McDonald's. He never has McDonald's. So tomorrow he's getting McDonald's and we get to have lunch for an hour and 15 minutes together. Oh, awesome. So we're blocking that in. That's cool. It's yeah. blocked. That's his it's so hour. So powerful, man. But you obviously were someone who couldn't do that in the past and can do it now. For the person riding in that seat listening to this, who's, guys, I get it. That's awesome. I want it. How are you doing it with real estate? Yeah. How could someone else listening to this get that bridging gap to to the freedom? I mean, ultimately, we're talking about freedom, isn't it? Time, Absolutely. time, energy, and it's choice. It's all about freedom. And I just want to say this for anybody listening to this is I didn't have some epiphany. Like, I didn't learn this. I had to learn it because... I was literally on divorce number two. Thank God it didn't happen, but I had to learn it the hard way. I'm a slow learner. I'm a like hard headed. So I had to learn it the hard way. And it's just, that's it, period. I'll, I'll stop it there. But once I got, I haven't had a job since 2018. And how did I build that freedom was going out there and taking massive action. I heard that podcast and what I do is I get something from a podcast and this was, I don't listen to podcasts anymore because I'm, really content with the way business is going. But what I would do is I would take that 30 seconds when I would pull over after I had heard that podcast, whenever I get to work and write down one line of the action step I was going to take and then block it in my calendar to take it. And it's usually that night after the, my first child went to bed, my newborn. And then I just kept building it and building it. So I took that knowledge, what I heard this guy saying he was mailing landowners. And I the first list I thought to mail landowners was, what about the people not paying their back taxes? I got that list from the tax collector, the, the county treasurer, 
And then I got a virtual assistant off of Upwork for $5 an hour. I did a couple. I did it over video. It was Screencast-O-Matic. The first 15 are free. And I showed her how to get the mailing address and the name of that landowner. And boy, this was tedious. Right. So I showed her like two or three. And then I put it in Word, exactly the steps to take, put the actual addresses. And here's where I screwed up. I let her go. I should have told her, get back with me when you've done 15. But she was doing it all wrong. <laughs> and I had the correct course uh -oh. with her. No audit in your, what you created was a standard operating procedure. And that's, that's right. That's right. But what I did was I didn't inspect it. So she ran off for 15 hours, like whatever, $5 an hour. It added up. I didn't have the money for that back then. Yeah. So I was like, okay, let's fix this. So three and a half weeks later, I get the list. I mailed it that night. I mailed, I found a mail house, the land offer or landofferletters.com. It's 3D mail out in Washington. They mailed this postcard that said, hey, my name is Brent. I'd like to buy your land at 123 Main Street if it had an address. If it didn't, we just said in El Paso County, Colorado, if you're interested in a fast cash fair price offer, call me or text me. God bless you, Brent. Then my phone number. And the phone started ringing. If anybody wants a copy of that. Pretty irresistible offer right there, because you know that they're in a distressed situation. Yeah. They're on back on their taxes and that they're going to at least check it out and find out what it's exactly. about. Exactly. I mailed 687 landowners and these people were on the county held tax lien list, which I didn't know the difference back then, but I can explain it now. Basically, this land was so inefficient, it was not buildable. It was not accessible. It was landlocked. All kinds of basically what I call garbage land. These people didn't want it, nor were tax lien investors, people that pay the back taxes and get a return on investment. No one was buying yeah. it. So the county thought I was going to pay for these back taxes and they didn't understand that I was trying to buy the land from the owners. So they started calling, yeah, uh -huh. take the lands. Like I did two land deals off of that list, bought one for $285, sold it for five grand to a realtor, bought one for 500. The second one was for $500 and I sold that one for 500 down and 400 a month. And that's the one that changed my paradigm Stephen Covey talks about because I was like, oh my God, yeah. this is true passive Excellent. income. I was profitable from day one and forever. Not like a rental house. So you bought the tax lien for 500. Nope, I bought the land. And you basically bought the land for $500. Yes. How much land was, was 4. that? 4.9 acres surrounded by state park. You bought 4.9 acres for 500 bucks. That's insane. In Colorado Springs. So basically the back taxes. In Colorado Springs, that's like prime real estate, man. Yeah, right next to NORAD. And then you turned around and basically rented the land back to them. That's genius. I'll tell you, it, I, I didn't like, you know why I offered seller financing? Because I didn't have confidence. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't think the land's worth anything. Mm -hmm. I had to yeah. trespass to get to it. I actually got caught by one of the state park um, officers. And he's like, no, you, you, like, you can't. I was like, well, I own that land. He goes, you can't come across the state park. You have to f repel in from a helicopter. I was like, really? So I just disclosed it all. I said, you're going to need a real estate attorney, someone that knows wow. ingress, egress, because I didn't have the money to pay an attorney. I'm like, attorneys cost like almost a, a gazillion dollars an hour, right? I didn't have $350 an hour. What a fun adventure. So what happened with the next one? You just did you, I mean, you dialed in on finding properties that you could, in essence, yeah. sell or finance and then rent it back. Well, the third one, the third land deal, I almost, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. A bank calls me. It says, yeah, we'll, we'll sell you the land. And I was like, well, I have no clue what it's worth. And this was in 2016, 44 acres next to Shriver Air Force Base in Colorado Springs next to an Air Force Base. And they said, look, we'll sell it to you. And I, I made an offer of 20 grand because I had no clue what it was worth. I knew it was probably worth about 80,000 maybe, but I was scared. So when I'm uncertain, I'm going to go for the massive discount is there's a book called Go For No, basically. I was going for no. Go for no. And <laughs> that. Yeah. No doesn't always mean N-O. Sometimes it means K-N-O-W. It's not always a hard Oh, I'm going to no. take that. That's no. really good, actually. Well, literally, I go, I wait for the hell no. Okay. Hell no. Hell no. Never call me again. Report junk. Block your messages yeah. or whatever. Otherwise, it's a K-N-O-W. They may not know the value of the offer or your position, or they may not understand it, or they may not know what questions That's to right. ask. That's right. They don't know yet. Well, this banker calls me back on a Friday a couple of weeks later after I gave him the offer of 20 grand. He goes, listen, Brent, if you want this land, you need to take it today for 25000 or don't ever call me again. So I took a deep breath and said, let's do it. And I sent them the purchase agreement that day. I was literally an executive officer in the army. I closed my, my door, sent out that purchase agreement. And I did not sleep that night because I didn't have $25,000. I didn't know how I was going to get it. Well, I drove my wife <laughs> and my newborn son to Denver International Airport because they were going to Florida to visit our family. 
And I went out and I, I had 33 bandit signs. And I said, 44 acres, cash only, 38K, my phone number. I had it under contract for 25,000, an assignable contract that I could sell my contract to a buyer, a cash buyer. And I was asking for 38,000. So I was going to keep the difference, whatever, 25, 35, 36, 37, 30, 13,000 difference. So I put out 33 signs. I actually wasn't even done putting out the signs yet. The first call that came in, the guy literally cussed me out and said, don't you ever put another sign on my land. I was like, I'm so sorry. Just throw it away. Second call comes in. I brace for impact <laughs> and it waiting for another yell. yell I was down, like yeah. maybe 18 signs in. I was hustling because I wanted to sleep that Saturday night. I was looking for a buyer. And I don't know why I didn't just put it on yep. Craigslist because we stop doing what actually works and we look for other things because, well, that can't be, the that can't work a second time. Right. So I went out and put signs out on the third property. So I get a call from a sweet Texan. Like he goes, where are you at? I, we're driving around everywhere. We've sold our ranch in Texas a couple of weeks ago. We're looking for land out here. And I was like, well, I'm here, but I can meet you at the property if you want. We met 10 minutes later, shook hands. He said, I'll take it. I get a call the next day and they're offering me like $50,000 for this land. So now I'm getting like a bidding war. So I call this Texan back. And I was like, hey, I got about a 14000 15000 or $14,000 price higher than what we had already agreed on. But I really feel bad because I want to sell it to you. But you know what? I'll just split that $14,000 extra with you and give you seven grand just for meet me on the side of the road. He goes, no, we had a deal. You told me you'd sell me the land and I s swallowed a huge gulp and I said, Ah, okay, let's just do it. Cause I mean, that additional 14 grand yeah. back then, plus the 13 grand, I was like, oh, okay, that was a big difference. Yeah. Very I thought hard. that would have changed my life. I'm so glad I kept my word yeah. because you kept your word. Yeah, God sure. has opened up the floodgates. Like he has filled our barns and what a test. You had a test in that moment and it would have been a crime of opportunity to have basically killed the deal with the guy who you honored your word to and took the 50 grand. And most likely, you know what would have happened if you went after that 50 grand? They would have backed out. The deal would have fell through. Yeah. Well, I'll yeah. tell you. You would have lost a ball. Um, there's actually. That would have been a life lesson waiting for you on the other side yeah. of that deal. I'll tell you what. I kicked myself for days and days. And it's like, I should have just done it. I could have paid off my student loan debts. and But now, many years later, and seeing yes. you know all these payments we have coming in every single. Sometimes we're paid three, four times a day for land. And just like, yeah. you know, that was one of the many, many tests. <laughs> but it, it didn't come with a lot of, no, without a lot of failures. Well, anything on the other side of risk is opportunity, right? And it's just, I, I teach this little entrepreneurship course every Wednesday to homeschoolers and I constantly remind them what's the difference between someone who's self-employed or employed and someone who's a business owner. And the answer is risk. Mm. It literally comes down to what you're willing to risk for the opportunity. And I'm not talking about integrity risk because you had a moment of integrity that was called into question and you answered the call. You aren't willing to risk your integrity for a few extra dollars and that's paid off tenfold in this. So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about is opportunity that's setting on the other side of risk where real reward is. None of my real opportunities have not come without risk that made other people extremely nervous, right? And not that it, I liked it per se. I was just willing to take that risk and you were also willing to take a risk higher than others might. But at the end of the day, there's all kinds of risk, isn't there? Oh. I mean, why do we have, why do we have insurance mm -hmm. <laughs> at all? Because we feel risk. Right. And the fear is, well, if I don't do that, I'm not being responsible. Therefore, I can mitigate the risk and the fear by buying the insurance. But there's no insurance in business at the end of the day, yeah. is there? Really not at the end so of the true. day. I mean, you take risk by having a TV in your home. What do I mean by that is I'm going to choose to take this afternoon or this evening or this Saturday to sit and eat a bag of chips and watch this Netflix series. Well, you could have taken that time that would ultimately compound your success and have created a, a, a side hustle that earns you an extra $5,000 a month in that same amount of time it took you to watch the entire Yellowstone series. Well, no knock Yellowstone now. You could have picked on something else. You could have picked on Ozark. My, well, yeah. I've been just watched all of that, by the way. That, that's that's, that's why I talked about Yellowstone. Because <laughs> like, it's one of those things I've been feeling bad about lately. You know, I could be using this time wisely. Right. Well, I'm hanging out with my wife. I love Yellowstone because... They're like these land barons, but no, you we're taking right. risks. Like you are taking risk. And you're taking a risk if you don't take the time driving home to listen to something to encourage or better yourself, which you did. You're taking risk by constantly wanting to change your life, but never actually taking the first step in action to even do something towards it, except lament over it to everybody and complain to your wife or just look at the bills and have the problems. I mean, speaking from experience, 
Nothing's going to happen if you don't take action. So for that reason, we're, we could go on for another hour, man. You and I could talk for another hour easy about a whole lot of stuff. But what I want people to do today is to listen to your story and take a little risk. And that would be to contact you today and find out what it takes to kind of replicate the process that you're doing, maybe with your help, for some opportunity cost, right? Because everything comes with an opportunity cost. And part of that risk and fear is going to be the chance you have to do it or not do it. But if you're feeling it today and you like the conversation with Brent, and he's a very good guy that I've come to respect, then I suggest you reach out to him and contact him. And where can they find you? Yeah, head on over to thelandsharks.com, schedule a call. If you just want to check me out a little bit more. And every day I come out with a video on TikTok, Brent L. Bowers, Brent L. is on land, Brent L. Bowers 1 on TikTok. I just recently started putting out a video a day. I'm teaching people how to make money with land. There you go. Well, man, thanks for coming on and sharing some good stuff. Thanks for having me, Neil. God bless you, man. You too, brother.